uh, we move on uh, with a short uh, plenary discussion where we would like to um, we would like to give get some feedback from you uh, and ask you some some uh, questions. I I involved my colleague Heidi Dufkanen to this uh, to this session, uh, and I remind you again that we go back to uh, to Mentimeter. Uh, so I hand it over to you, uh, Heidi. Right. Yeah. So nice to hear. The local perspective from Turku. Okay, great. Now I can see the question as well. <laughs> um, so first we wanted to get some feedback related to what has been presented today already to see how relevant you perceive the, for example, the different parts of the Cascade toolbox to be. These are the project outputs. Um, so if you could go through and give us your answers, we have the, the guidelines for climate risk assessment. We have an overview of climate hazards and consequences. Um, we also have some uh, some guidance related to and based on numerous different projects uh, to overcoming barriers to climate adaptation. It could also um, be relevant to other sustainable development actions and progress there. Uh, there's training materials on the climate risk assessment for practitioners, and there's also the university courses for climate risk assessment and then the policy recommendations for integrating uh, climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Great. So we have very dynamic answers here. Of course, you haven't been able to to uh, you know fully <laughs> fully know yeah. what it's just from the idea of what you exactly. Have. And I, I think, as was mentioned before, that the the tool the contents of the tool kit is only partly available currently. But at least um, I, I believe that the guidelines, the first, I think. I think all of them, except maybe the uh, policy recommendations, are actually online already. So they're all getting quite high scores. It's, it's nice to see. It's changing. We have 17 people, 17, 18 people that have given responses. And we have some 50 people still listening to us. I'm, I'm glad that. Uh... Uh, quite many uh, are still, uh, we started out a bit over 50 people, so I'm glad to hear that you have been, uh, you are still here with us and, and listening. Yeah, and if there's any questions that have arisen since the, the toolkit was presented, we could also, we could also, of course, answer them. Now there's 25 people that have answered. Maybe we leave it there. Yes. So we perhaps can. yes. It's great to see. So now we zoom zoom out a little bit more to look at some of the broader issues dealing with resilience. Uh, yes. So I just wanted to share the OECD definition of resilient cities. They're they're cities that have the ability to absorb, recover, re and prepare for future shocks. And those shocks can be economic, environmental, social, as well as institutional. And these kinds of cities also promote sustainable development, well-being, and inclusive growth. I think we've, we've heard um, this reflected in all of the discussions today. There's also in another important component of resilience in cities um, and in any kinds of organizations, actually, and that happens through learning through experiences and the development of the capacities based on those learned ex learnings. Um, and this is what helps our cities and organizations to deal not only with these future shocks, but also the changing situations. And as Mika was talking about, the uncertainties. We have to make investment decisions under cases of lack, lack of data and lots of uncertainty about how things will exactly be in the future. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this, uh, this learning, and this learning happens exactly through these kinds of um, partnerships and, and collaboration, but also through monitoring and, and looking ahead. So then I think we can move to the next question. We'll, we'll do some word clouds um, to crowdsource your ideas for actions. So the, the question is, name three actions to support the societal learning required for dealing with changing the changing situation and uncertainties of the future. So here we're looking to you for your ideas. 
So I think you can put in three kind of short phases or, or phrases or, or words to describe your ideas. There is up to, up to three ideas. Yeah, there's no um, wrong answers here. So it's based on your opinions. Nobody's brave enough to start. It might require, of course, some kind of thinking. <laughs> Good one. So let's try to get at least 25 participants from the, for, uh, for this question as well. Nice. So we see a lot of education, civic courses. There's a lot of this um, actual direct education and societal learning. There's a cooperation exercise that could also that could mean exercise, but also could be um, exercises together with other organizations, like joint exercises between different kinds of uh, different cities or maybe even different departments. Education is still the highest. And communication, of course, is involved in all those things. Risk management. We're up to 15. 10 more. Public consultation is, uh, is mentioned. And I think here the societal learning also happens through these kinds of um, what's discussed a lot is these co-creative co opportunities or co-creative methods where there's actual um, knowledge that's produced together with other stakeholders. So it's, it's less about consultation, but it's more about actually uh, learning together and, and involve, like real involvement of the different kinds of stakeholders. Preparedness. Learning from the past, yes. Continuity, there's so many now, I'm having a hard time seeing them. <laughs> it's getting, getting Yes, small. it's getting small. It's bigger, but it okay. doesn't, uh, it doesn't need, uh, make it bigger if I yeah. zoom. Uh, but I think we can probably, we're, we're at 23 and it's been quiet, so we can move on to the next question, which I believe is our, is our last question, or second to last question. Um, and this one is name three actions to ensure that the most vulnerable segments of society are included in resilience planning. So um, earlier we heard mentions also about the just resilience um, and the need to have equitable resilience and not leave any segments in society or vulnerable sectors behind. So now we're trying to get your ideas for how we can ensure that the most vulnerable segments of society are included in this planning and that the whole society moves forward. And actually, instead of building back better, we can build forward better as is, is being used now as the phrase. So access to fair housing, environmental justice, yes, knowledge, empowerment, mapping needs, very good. Um, dialogue with different groups, engagement, yeah. And I think that there's a lot of good examples across the Baltic Sea region of engagement um, already happening, for example, in urban planning. Urban planning is is being highlighted also here as something that also relates to this fair housing and or this maybe housing policies, inclusive planning and mapping of needs. And as was mentioned before, this um, nature-based solution, solutions are also a uh, one of the one of the the key methods that are that are pushed for um, to help adaptation and uh, disaster risk reduction and even in in the planning of um, nature-based solutions and green infrastructure, there are many different good ex examples across the Baltic Sea region of um, how to use participation there. So 
we have 14. There's still still answers coming in. Non-private financing, so it'd be like public financing, debates. There's that's always a way to to get to some kinds of um, new understandings. Compensation for losses. It's one method. Someone also mentioned some different kinds of groups like retired, maybe like retirees or pensioners. Older people definitely need to be involved in, in planning and their needs need to be met, um, especially with some of the risks that uh, have a specific impacts on, on them. Great. So I think actually we can leave it there. We've had some great ideas. Thank you. Somebody also, okay, Mika answered one of uh, a question. Um, yeah, so now I'll actually uh, turn the floor back to uh, Mika so he can do the, the wrap up and the closing words. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you all for, for participating uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this little uh, interaction. And Mika, yes, the word. The, Word is the last words I give to you as uh, our project coordinator. Yeah, thank you, Evelyn. First of all, I would like to thank all the presenters for this uh, interesting presentations, and uh, and of course our project team and uh, <clears throat> all friends and colleagues to whom I'm proud to be working with with this project because uh, we have had challenges during our project time. Not the smallest problem was the COVID-19, but uh, in my opinion, our team was very successful and uh, fulfilled all the all the obligations that we have promised in our in our application with the DG Echo. And uh, what could I say? I'm uh, uh, proud of you all, and uh, I would uh, like to uh, continue our cooperation even after our project time and maybe in some follow-up project. But uh, one thing I would have to remind that we still have a couple of deliverable, deliverables to deliver. And uh, I'm sure that the reports will be finalized soon. And, uh, and you see as our financial manager wanted to remind about the financial reporting also because he wasn't able to participate today. So he sent her his regards by me to for you all. But on and on, I would like to once again thank you all for this project and for this uh, final conference. A big thanks to Jutta for organizing all the technicalities and Evelyn for facilitating this uh, final conference. And uh, what could I say? Well, Thank you and uh, have a nice summer vacation for all of you and uh, see you soon somewhere, hopefully. And I also encourage to uh, encourage to, to take, take a look at our website and to, to get a uh, possibility to get deeper into all the results that were presented today. Yes. Thank you all and yes. have a nice, thank you Mika for this closing words. Thank you.